Hey guys, Mr. Mazurkowitz, and in this video I'll be talking about energy flow and ecosystems. So we'll be taking a look at things like food webs and food chains and really understanding what's happening to energy as it moves from organism to organism through these feeding relationships. Before we do that, I just wanted to remind everyone about our global ecosystem. So here's a picture of Earth as seen from the moon. Sometimes this image uh, helps capture that we are on one planet, one home, and we share this with all the other organisms. So it's really uh, important to keep in mind that we as humans, even though we sometimes think of ourselves as removed, because we're advanced, we are still part of this global ecosystem and play just as crucial role as everyone and everything else does. So our less than essential question here is how does a food web represent the flow of energy through an ecosystem? By the end of this, you should be able to look at a diagram of a food web, really understand what's happening to energy as it moves from organism to organism, and how removing just one of these organisms or species might affect everyone else, because again, we are all connected. Before we can start talking about this, we really need to understand where does the energy in food come from? We know that when we eat food, we get the energy from it, but where did that energy come from? Well, it all originates from the sun. Most of the energy, if not all the energy that we eat, originates from the sun, and it's through this process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is just a process using carbon dioxide, water, but most importantly, the energy in sunlight to make oxygen, but more importantly, this molecule, C6H12O6, or sugar, glucose. But that is the process where we're going to get energy from the sun into our food. The organisms that can do this are called producers. So all the producer is is an organism that can make their own food or make glucose. So think about what it means to produce, it means to make. So organisms like our terrestrial plants that you see outside and even aquatic plants in the photic zones of aquatic ecosystems, they're using that sunlight to do photosynthesis and turn that energy into chemical food energy. Sometimes students ask me about, well, what about carnivorous plants like Venus flytraps that eat insects? Are they producers? They are. They do photosynthesis. They're making food. They actually eat insects in order to make up for the nutrients that are lacking in their soil. But because they make sugars, they do photosynthesis, they too are producers. What about organisms that live at the bottom or the aphotic zones of oceans where there is no light? There are ecosystems down there. Where are they getting their energy from? So there are even another, is another process called chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis, but chemosynthesis where organisms like the tube worms here seen in this picture are using chemical energy, not sun energy, but using chemical energy to make their own food. One thing that all four of these pictures have in common, though, are these are organisms that are making their own food, so therefore they are called producers. What about organisms that can't make their own food like us? I can't make my own food. I can maybe make it in the kitchen, but I can't make it in my cells. So therefore, I am called a consumer. A consumer are the organisms that obtain their food by eating other organisms. So we're going to take a look at a simple food chain here, an aquatic food chain. We'll start with our producer here. These are phytoplankton. These are organisms floating around in the surface waters doing photosynthesis, making their own foods. So they are producers. Well, they are going to be eaten by a consumer, in this case, zooplankton or krill. That krill will also be eaten by another organism, let's say a fish, and that fish in turn will be eaten by a seal. So our krill, our fish, and our seal are all types of consumers, but we have different names for them or words that we put in front just to kind of differentiate between them. So our krill is something that we call a primary consumer, primary meaning first. Primary consumers are going to be the consumers that eat producers. They're the first consumer in a food chain. Therefore, our fish isn't our primary consumer. They are called a secondary consumer. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumer. And then a tertiary consumer, tertiary means third, that is going to be a consumer that eats our secondary consumer. So all three of these guys are types of consumers. They obtain their food by eating other organisms, but we just give them different names based off of where they fall in a food chain. One last uh, group of organisms worth mentioning are our decomposers. So they don't really have one specific place in our food web or food chain. They are going to be organisms that recycle nutrients of dead organisms back into the ecosystem. So they pretty much eat everything once it's dead. But they are essential. Things like fungi, earthworms, bacteria, really any organism that's going to eat and help decay uh, dead organisms. They are crucial because they play a role in our biogeochemical cycles to return these locked up nutrients back to the ecosystem. So one thing worth mentioning, this was in the news recently, is if we go to Chernobyl in Russia, there was a disaster in 1986. So this picture here is showing a nuclear power plant that had an explosion in 1986. Uh, so a lot of that radioactive material got into the atmosphere and into the ecosystem. So it wiped out many of the organisms and still continues to have an effect on them today. Well, one of the groups of organisms that it's wiped out are our decomposers. So if we go to the forests in Chernobyl and around that area, here are some trees that have been laying dead for the last 30 years since 1986, and they're not decaying. They're not going anywhere. 
Why not? Well, because the decomposers, the earthworms, the bacteria, the fungi that would normally break these things down have disappeared. They've been killed off and haven't returned because of the radioactive material. So I just thought this example was cool because it shows if we remove decomposers from an area, how that can have an impact on the ecosystem. So aside from talking about consumers or producers or decomposers, we also have another term that's very similar called trophic levels. And you just got to think of this as like a level of a house or a level of a building. Our producers are always at the very bottom because they're the ones, this is where the energy is going to start. So our producers would be what we call our first trophic level. It's the first level in our building. Well, the ones that eat the producers, our primary consumers, therefore, are going to be our second trophic level. The secondary consumers that eat the primary consumers, therefore, will be our third trophic level. And then our tertiary consumers would be our fourth trophic level. So in other words, all that a trophic level is, when you hear this term from here on out, is each step in a food chain, a food web, or an energy pyramid. So what happens to energy then as it moves through a food chain? As it goes from trophic level to trophic level, what's happening to that energy? Well, one thing you should think of is, well, I need energy to live. I need it to survive. That is true. The energy that you consume is going to be used up. Does all of it get used up? Well, not necessarily, because if you use it all up, then where would an organism that eats the other organism get it from? So 90% of the energy that is consumed by an organism gets used up. The majority of it does get used up for things like growth, reproduction, moving around, making proteins, all the cellular things that go on. That's what we're using that energy for. But what's happening to that other 10%, 10% is going to get stored in the tissues of that organism. And it's that 10% that gets passed on to the next trophic level. So in ecology, we have what's called the rule of 10. And that just means that 10% of the energy moves from level to level. So we're going to take a look at, let's say, this uh, feeding relationship or this food chain here. Let's start at the very bottom with the producers, these plants. Let's say these producers make a thousand units of energy through photosynthesis. Well, how much energy is going to be left when we get to our first level consumer, like the grasshoppers here? Well, 10% of a thousand is a hundred. So just move the decimal over one to the left and you get a hundred units of energy. How much energy is for our frogs that eat the grasshoppers? Well, move the decimal over one more. That's 10 units of energy. And then 10% of 10 is only one unit of energy when we get to our top level consumer. So again, you notice that 90% gets used up each time, only 10% moves on. And we can easily calculate that. Don't worry about getting a calculator. You just got to move the decimal over to the left one to get your new uh, number, your 10% of that number. So let's try a practice problem here and see if you can figure this out. If a producer made 2,452 units of energy through photosynthesis, how much energy would a secondary consumer receive? How much energy is going to be left over by the time we get to our secondary consumer? You should pause the video at this time, try it out, and then when you're ready to see the answer, you can continue playing. So if a producer produced, again, 2,452 units of energy, that means our primary consumer that eats that producer is only going to get 10% of that because 90% gets used up. So that would be 245.2 units of energy. I just moved the decimal over once. If I go to my secondary consumer that eats that, again, move the decimal over one more time to get 10% of that. That means 24.52 units of energy. You notice it's a lot less than what we started with because we only got 10% to move on each level. Let's try one more practice problem here to see if you're really following along. If a producer made 922 kilojoules of energy, a kilojoule is just a measurement of energy, so don't let that throw you off. If it made 922 kilojoules through photosynthesis, how much energy would be available at the fourth trophic level? So now we also have to apply what we know about trophic levels. So again, pause the video and see if you can figure this out, and then click play to check your answer. So our first trophic level, our producer, is going to produce 922 kilojoules of energy. Remember that the first trophic level is always the producers. Well, our second trophic level, the one that eats the producer, is going to have only 92.2 kilojoules because we're going to take 10% of that, move the decimal over, move it over one more time for our third trophic level. Now we're down to 9.22 kilojoules of energy, which means that our fourth trophic level that eats the third trophic level is only going to be left with 0.922 kilojoules of energy left over. So it's just important to realize that 10%, every time we move from organism to organism, only 10% moves on, the other 90% gets used up. So we can show this by using a graphic, what we call an energy pyramid. And all that an energy pyramid, again, is a picture that shows how energy is going to decrease as we move from organism to organism. If we start at the base with our primary producer, our first trophic level, we'll start with 100%. They have all the energy through either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. And as we move up to a first level consumer and then a second level consumer and a third, we're only getting 10% each time. So by the time we get to the top, we're only left with 0.1%. 
of the original energy. Let the rest, you can see, was given off as heat energy because when we burn it off, heat is released. So all an energy pyramid is, is going to show us how energy decreases from trophic level to trophic level. We start with a lot at the bottom, but as we make our way up to the top, it gets skinnier and skinnier, less and less energy. An energy pyramid not only shows us that energy decreases from bottom to top, but also that population sizes also decrease. And that's because if there's less energy, there's less organisms that can be supported by that. So if we're to take a look at this pyramid here at the bottom right, the plants, we notice that they have the highest population. If we had more grasshoppers than there were plants, well then they would eat all the plants and then those would disappear, then the grasshoppers would disappear, and then the rest of the ecosystem would crash. So a stable ecosystem has most population at the bottom and then it gets less and less as you get to the top. So in other words, it's going to take a large amount of producers to support a smaller amount of primary consumers. And then it's going to take a large amount of primary consumers to support a smaller amount of secondary consumers. Again, all we're saying is that populations are decreasing. And if you think about any ecosystem, that's true. The last thing we'll look at is a food web. And all that a food web is, is a diagram that's going to show all the interconnected food chains that show all the feeding relationships in an ecosystem. So it's pretty much taking a bunch of food chains and connecting them to show the entire ecosystem's relationship. So when we look at this, one last thing we should remember is that each time we move from one organism to another, the energy that moves on is only 10%. 90% gets used up and then moves on to the next organism. Another thing you should be able to do is look at this food web and kind of predict what would happen if we messed up with the populations in this food web. In other words, how all these organisms are connected. So let's just say that I use an insecticide in this ecosystem and I wipe out one of these populations, the yellow spiders here. How might that impact the rest of the ecosystem? Well, for starters, let's take a look at the insectivorous birds that eat these spiders. Well, what's going to happen to their population if they have less food? They'll still have food from these guys, but with less food and less energy means a smaller population. So we'd expect their population to decrease. Less insectivorous birds means less food for the foxes, the hawks, the owls, and the snakes. So we can see that just by wiping out this one here, other organisms are affected. Well, how about the ones that these spiders eat? So the herbivorous insects that are eaten by the spiders. If these spiders are not here to keep their population in check, we would expect their population to increase. They have less things eating them. With more herbivorous insects, that means less grass because their population is going to start eating all of the plants. That means less food for the birds, the mice, the squirrels, and the rabbits. And then you can see that it's just this domino effect uh, between all these organisms. So just keep in mind that, or remember what I said at the beginning of this uh, video, all organisms are connected to each other. It's through this energy flow that all organisms are connected. And by just messing up one population, we can affect the rest. So that's really it. Going back to our less than essential question, how does a food web represent the flow of energy through an ecosystem? Some terms should come to mind. You should think about what it means to be a producer, what it means to be a primary, secondary, tertiary consumer, what the term trophic level means, and just remember that big rule of 10, that only 10% of that energy moves from level to level. And you should also, again, be able to look at a food web, really understand how all organisms are connected, and how just wiping out one population does impact the rest, and being able to predict how. If you got that, I think you got energy flow in ecosystems, and you're good. Thanks a lot, guys, and I hope you learned something.